Finding Financial Freedom, a $34 billion industry. Hi everyone, hi Nicolas, Ernesto, Juan David, very good to, to have the three of you here today. Thank you Beatrice. Thank you, Thank you Beatrice, it's, it's a pleasure. Thank you for making the panel. Um, to start with, maybe with, uh, with Nicolas, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, of course, the lack of uh, financial inclusion uh, is definitely being a serious handicap for the 1.7 billion uh, people out there who are unbanked and, uh, or underbanked. Uh, but it's also as well uh, serious uh, missed opportunities as well for financial institutions who are definitely, I mean, losing a lot of opportunities and so on. Uh, but still, we have seen a couple of them who have started to take some uh, initiatives uh, in terms of adapting to the blockchain technology. Could you highlight maybe what are the traditional, let's say, financial institutions uh, doing uh, in that respect? Yeah, exactly. Just well, thank you for having me. And I think to this, this question, I, I wish I had more of an optimistic answer to this kind of, you know, initiative of larger banks or commercial financial institutions taking a step into Latin America. Uh, the problem that I've seen so far is that when you, you know, vis I'm visiting here currently in Europe right now, and I've, I've also kind of gotten a feeling from U.S. banks as well, uh, that you're not seeing a major push. You are seeing some companies experimenting with distributed ledger technology and trying to build kind of new payment networks, maybe working with kind of some of the more kind of institutional grade projects in crypto. Uh, but the, the real key issue here that a lot of these companies run into, it's not that they per se don't want to reach these markets. There's obviously a great market to lend to. These are high growth economies. And in a lot of cases, you can actually, if you if you basically you know, right, know the right market to lend to, you can actually charge relatively low interest rates um, and have pretty good pay through. Uh, the problem is, is that you have two issues. Um, the biggest one here is that a lot of these companies don't know how to identify KYC and do credit checks for the end users they're trying to lend to in these regions. And along with that as well, it's a lot of regulatory red tape. You know, stepping into these regions, you know, you're curious about whether or not as a financial institution, like a big bank, for example, like here in, you know, where I'm at and stuff in Europe, you have big banks like Commerce Bank, uh, or you also have banks back in the United States like Bank of America. When they make a step into these markets, uh, they have to worry about the regulatory environment. And, you know, usually it tends to be that there's a cost associated with each account that a bank has. In this case, sometimes it's not financially feasible for them to make that move just yet. Uh, so what I think you're going to see really at the end of the day um, you know, is a lot of startups. And we're seeing all kinds of different startups across the board experimenting with building you know, crypto applications or wallets that allow you to tap into decentralized networks like Ethereum. I know Ernesto can probably speak that a little bit working at the, from the Dash community. But um, I think there's just such a fascinating realm of different uh, companies that are starting to do this. And you're going to see it come from the startup world more than anything. So uh, again, lots of solutions coming to the DeFi space, but we're going to have to, uh, again, I think, find a way to do credit measurements uh, and also proper KYC for a lot of these regions where it's a lot more difficult than maybe, you know, some of the developed regions of the world like the United States or Europe. Mm -hmm. And then Ernesto, actually, you are, you are located in Venezuela. Have you seen traditional financial institutions uh, taking some kind of initiatives as well uh, with adapting with the blockchain technology or DLTs in general? Yeah, so thank you for the, for the question, and I could not agree more with Nicolas. Um, although I'm now in Venezuela, I live in Mexico, where I'm based, and what I see is that Mexico is a very modern-looking country in terms of fintech. So there's, just like Nicolas said, lots of startups working on how to solve getting into these segments of the market. Um, it is spot on to say that what happens is there's only the top part of the economic segment of the population that is banned. You know, all these people, when you go to Mexico to a tianguis or when you're in Venezuela in a small mercado, many of them do not have bank accounts. And it's not because they don't want. It is because they're not profitable for banks. So it is now up for many startups to work their way into how to get to these people. Like, most of them do not have banks, ac accounts, or they don't have cards, but they have phones. So now with blockchain technology, starting with crypto payments, they have the ability to send and receive value in terms of their, of their phones. So that is step one. What I'm seeing as step two is that many of these companies are starting to 
work on block or with blockchain technology in order to record some of the uh, initiatives or some of the actions that are happening in, in these markets. So let's say we four are part of a group that were, you know, on a small town out, outside of Guadalajara in Mexico, and we ask for a credit. Whenever I pay, that can be recorded on the blockchain, and then financial institutions can see that, oh, Ernesto paid back his loan. So that can reduce costs and can provide access through blockchain technology. We're on very early stages, but what we are seeing is that many of these companies are disaggregating the processes and making them efficient so they can work on them, which is something that the larger institutions, mm -hmm. because of their size and because the way they are established right now, cannot do cost-wise. And also because the segment is a low budget segment, many are not entitled because there's not a, a lot of profit there. So there is a big chance to, you know, implement many of these tools. And, you know, we can talk about how we think on the next question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Juan David, maybe would you like to, to highlight uh, the key advantages and benefits uh, of blockchain and uh, digital ledger technologies for, uh, for financial inclusion? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when it comes down to uh, lo also looking at it from a different aspect, uh, I, I work in, in the side that is more the, the heavy infrastructure for the B2B in the industry. So we, we work in everything that is uh, algorithmic trading and financial infrastructure. So when you look at it as well from how do we make uh, large financial institutions to engage into, into the ecosystem, it comes down to really having very strong infrastructure. So you, everything that you're talking about, having a correct way of, of, uh, of measuring risk in a scalable way, it all comes down to actually do we have the infrastructure to be able to do it. And the reality is that a lot of these financial institutions and a lot of these banks, they, they don't have a real incentive to take the risk if they don't have to. So, but that doesn't mean that they don't want to go there. That just means that they might go there with a different approach. The different approach might be, for example, doing heavy investments in the startups that are building those technologies and being ready to acquire those companies later on. So when it comes down to how is this going to change the landscape, especially in, uh, in countries like in South America and, and Southeast Asia and so on, what we see is that you have both uh, very large startups that are heavily investing in these industries, but they are a lot of times backed by large financial institutions as well that are ready to put the money and potentially acquire them later on once they manage to provide value to the masses. But in the meantime, uh, effectively because of the cost that it takes to, to onboard a large amount of people, why would a financial institution take that risk when they know that they can actually take another way just through, through a more venture approach to the industry? Which so far is, it, it, is, it is working because a lot of these banks, even if you were mentioning a commerce bank, they they as well invest in uh, in different companies that are that are creating a lot more B two C driven products. Yeah, uh, Juan David, uh, would you have a concrete example or case studies about um, about a project or a company that is using blockchain technologies or DLT, which has been as shown uh, being very successful for financial inclusion? Yeah, I mean, I think I think when it comes down to uh, to majority of these projects, we need to we need to still realize that the the heavy users of the technologies are going to be early adopters. You know, like mm -hmm. even when you think about, I'm originally from from Colombia. When you think about majority of these, for example, lending lending systems, I think they open they open a tremendous amount of power to people in uh, in developing economies that don't have access to the capacity for lending structures that you do in the in the first world. Now that being said. Still today, we're at a point where uh, to be able to use and take advantage of these, you need to be quite a sophisticated user. So even people that I know that are taking advantage of these in countries like Colombia or, or, or any other South American country are, are still today not majority of the, of the people that you really want to target as, as, let's say, creating social inclusion are going to be just people that realize that they have a need and they have somehow maybe a small advantage in their own country because they have a uh, slightly better education and they, and they take advantage of it. So the reality is that, for example, if everything related to, to automated lending is, is a super interesting case because in, in, in South America, for example, banks really locking uh, the society to use the banking system as is. Like people don't even have the capacity to own and have bank accounts denominated in dollars, which of course restricts their capacity to manage wealth and ultimately the capacity to preserve wealth, which is a gigantic problem because if you want to get a mortgage, 
and you have to pay a 15% uh, per year on your mortgage compared to uh, what I pay in Europe at 1%. Of course, I have a competitive advantage to build my wealth long term over everybody that is there. Now, now they can actually use uh, cryptocurrencies to use uh, stable currencies to have a value in dollars or Bitcoin. And then on top of that, they can use that to stake and lend capital to maybe get a mortgage. And it's something that does exist, and the example is there. But what is not there, yes, is the is the mass use because the early adopter is actually the the the, the educated person in the developing the developing world. Mm -hmm. mm. And uh, Ernesto, um, do you think there are some key challenges with the blockchain infrastructure that could be a blocker um, to its potential for financial inclusion? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, um, li like we're talking, financial inclusion is still work in progress. There is a possibility there. I see it here in Venezuela, in Mexico, in Argentina. People in these uh, economies that have troubles, they need something else. They don't want to stay with the local currency. Just to give you an example, I, I arrived here for work in March and one dollar was 70,000 bolivars. Today, one dollar is 340,000 bolivars. So that pushes people to look for something else. So on the other side, there is crypto, there are stable coins, there are coins that fluctuate in price with Dash and Bitcoin, but it is still not very easy. So what needs to happen is easy solutions, regulators also need to do their part and not make it you know, impossible for startups to develop uh, solutions and education and awareness need to happen. So if you tell me these three things in that order, making it easy, making sure that it can be compliant with laws and we can keep act bad actors outside, and then educate and tell people about it are the three stages that I believe need to happen. Okay, and Nicola, in, uh, in the technology itself of blockchain, uh, the way it's all set up, um, do you see any kind of uh, blocker um, to its potential? Yeah, I think for blockchain, one of the biggest issues right now, and I, I know this probably isn't an issue on maybe the Dash network or some of the crypto networks who have really focused on either keeping transaction fees low or practically non-existent. Um, you know, on networks like Ethereum right now, we're seeing decentralized finance take off. And there's not only two problems that I see in it. It's, it's not just an issue of the gas fees right now, which are not practical for anyone in Latin America, whether you're in you know, Brazil or in Argentina, to places as well like Venezuela that are in financial turmoil. There is no reasonable way they can utilize any of these decentralized financial applications. They can't even probably justify sending an Ether transaction over the network, which is still going to cost you three to five bucks at any given time. But the problem that I see as well is that with decentralized finance, I'd say the vast majority of it is kind of focused on building services for a bubble within the cryptocurrency space. There are applications over collateralized um, that don't really service people who need to get microfinancing in these regions. And a lot of it also as well is not tapping into real world markets. So even if you built something that was practical for someone in Latin America, it's still not really, you know, dealing with, you know, assets outside of, you know, just digital assets like Bitcoin or Ethereum. So I would really love to see DeFi, and I think we're starting to see it, starting to materialize, and we'll see it over the next year or so, where we start to focus on under-collateralized loans. We start to focus on bringing in assets and other participants in the market that have uh, not been involved yet. I think that's, I think it's our own ignorance of thinking that, you know, what we're focusing on right now is being the golden goose of decentralized finance. The real, you know, multi-trillion dollar kind of part of the equation that I think we still haven't tapped into is actually reaching people who need this the most. And it's going to be billions of people who have never had this level of financial experience. Because if you can, you know, you, for example, like right now, we built a crypto smart wallet that you can use on an iPhone or an Android phone. And it basically acts like a digital bank account that anyone can get access to, uh, plugging into decentralized financial services. So being able to give someone a stable coin, being able to give them you know, the ability to transfer or send and receive funds, like a remittance application, I think that's going to be huge. Mm -hmm. And uh, Juan David, I mean, one important uh, topic as well would be the cultural adoption as well. 
Um, are there any specific initiatives that uh, you would like to see or that exist already as to create more awareness and education uh, about blockchain, what it can bring uh, and its potential for uh, financial inclusion? I think, I mean, I think when it comes down to that, the, the interesting part of it is that, and of course, everybody will have their own opinion, but the way that I see it is that we don't need to be educating people. Like uh, the, the concept of blockchain at the end of the day is something that we talk about because it helps us to understand the, the, the potential of it. But the reality is that blockchain is a backend technology. Like mm -hmm. people, people are not talking about how the SWIFT network transfers money. No one, no one actually cares. Mm -hmm. what, what they care is the end result. So at the, I think at the end of the day, it's all about just value proposition. Like, and again, if the infrastructure is strong enough, we'll have a value proposition that we can educate people about. We can just say, okay, why would you use this? Because not because it's blockchain, but just because you have in your phone an app where you can hold your money in multiple currencies and your um, the, the, the amount that it costs you per month to have that is zero. I mean, it sounds evident, but in, in Latin America, just to have a bank account, you have to pay every month yeah. compared to in Europe where a bank account is free. And again, that as a value proposition needs to just be uh, explained and we, they need to change that mindset of, okay, or oh, financial services can actually be accessible and they can be free. And it's I also about the merchant being able to accept cryptocurrency as a payment method as well. It's both ways, correct. actually. It, it, it goes both ways, but at the end, it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't even need to be something that they say, okay, we accept cryptocurrency. It's just more, there is this new way of storing value, which is a new technology, and you can pay with it. And yeah. I'm sure that the technology used to accept Apple Pay is different than what you use for Visa, but mm -hmm. no one actually cares. Just the fact that you can you can pay with it. Yeah. So yeah. to speak to speak on that point, you said Juan David. I think the biggest ignorance we've had over the last decade in crypto that stunted adoption is we focus so much on on trying to constantly explain the technological side of things. When, as you mentioned, people want to know utility. If, if you can give someone an application. You know, uh, you know, Yana, who was supposed to be on the panel today and stuff, she's working on an application that's that's focused on basically bringing remittance services to regions in Latin America. And eventually, once you have you know stable coins and other crypto liquidity coming in, again, they don't have to know it's crypto. Yeah. In this case, the ability to send it back and forth, kind of like an e-wallet. I mean, this is just extremely valuable. And you know, as you mentioned, uh, you know, merchants want to receive dollars. They want to receive things that have some sense of stability. And as Ernesto mentioned, something that's not depreciating to one sixth of its original value just a couple of months later. So again, I think that's the ramification. It's the utility versus technology. Yeah. Okay. We're actually running a bit out of time. So just a, a last question as well, asking uh, your tech on. Uh, on a fact, which is of course that uh, blockchain enthousi enthusiasts are really boasting about about blockchain being the technology that is going to enable financial freedom uh, for the unbanked and the, the underbanked. But now you also have uh, some other people as well who are uh, stating that yes, of course, it's helping, but it's like the majority of uh, people being helped are not really the unbanked or the the underbanked but mostly the average people who just now uh, have access to a class of assets uh, uh, which are different and that you know used to be uh, just targeting uh, beforehand let's say the most wealthy people around so i mean the goal the final goal uh, then of that blockchain technology for financial inclusion was not really met what what is your take on that i mean i can give uh, an answer yeah, uh, please go on. If you want. Yeah, so um, I, I think that definitely we are still not banking the unbanked. Like we've spoken today, the technology is still very complicated and it is so difficult right now that, for example, DeFi is being used by the most technologically savvy people within crypto. Mm -hmm. So, but it's good because it's still a very nice experiment and these people are finding out stuff. Whenever they figure out what solutions work, some of them will be applied and will be simplified and will be translated into a language that anybody can understand. Just like, you know, you buy some furniture and it tells you, you know, put this pin here, insert this lot there, and that works. I believe we're doing the first steps to be able to give solutions to the people that are on bank, even though right now we're still not uh, doing it. So blockchain will be part of the solution and it will be a great tool that needs to be deployed. 
what David, you had a, what is your take on that statement? I'm just saying, I mean, look, financial services today, I mean, not even blockchain services, any financial service at the end of the day is going gonna, is gonna to be used by the one that ha has the biggest use for it, the biggest value proposition that, that you capture the value proposition. And indeed, in blockchain technologies is, is not different. So like, majority of the people that are taking advantage of this are the ones that the value proposition generates a lot of value. So if I am a company in Germany and I'm trying to set, to set up a, a pipe, an oil pipeline in Venezuela, I, it's actually very convenient for me to take uh, 500 Bitcoin and tra travel to Venezuela and sell this 500 Bitcoin there to actually pay for this pipeline. It sounds ridiculous, but I actually know someone that exactly did that, like a German company that is basically dealing with Bitcoin with, in Venezuela to set up a wow. massive product, product project. And then is he the, the poor person that, uh, of course not, I mean, the, the, this is a, a large German company. But that's where they find the value because they can, they can, they can, they, for them, the value of not having to go through the traditional system mm -hmm. is, is, is actually higher than for someone that has a, a, a lower amount of money. But it's the same that happens in, in other industries. I expect it to be the, the case, at least for, I would say, the next 15 years, where as the technology develops, majority of the people that find value in it would just be the, I would say, the, I would say the, the 1% in the world will be the ones that find the most value in it, and then it will start to go down. But even in, again, in a country like in Colombia, most probably the, the, the biggest value, value proposition of cryptos in, or in Venezuela or in Mexico is the capacity to store your wealth in an asset that will not depreciate if you want to. Like you could have USDC or USDT or whatever, just a stable dollar if you want. Yeah. I mean, that's already a value proposition. But that, that, but that's a value proposition that might be interesting for someone that has $50,000. Okay. But okay. The, the percentage of the population with $50,000 in Colombia is actually very small still. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, guys. I have to stop this. It's a shame because it's a very interesting panel. But thank you so much. I mean, all your insight was super valuable. So thank you very much for participating. Thank you. It was a pleasure, pleasure, everyone. Thank Talk you. Talk soon. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.